What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat. BDGE fantasy football. Another waiver wire video for you, as always, on these beautiful Tuesday mornings. Filming this on Monday, as always. But uh, listen, guys. Even if you are 0 and 4, does not mean you're out. I have seen teams that are 7 and 6 get into the playoffs. You can go on a run, and it all starts with your waiver wire pickup. It don't matter how bad your draft was. A lot of y'all probably drafted poorly. If you listen to my advice, you probably did. It's time to get into these waiver wire pickups. We have a lot of quarterbacks, not so many running backs. They are bare. And you know what? This is one point I want to get out there. Uh, you know, I put on Twitter the other day, and I was like, is anyone else at a fab budget? So in my E-Town Get Down League, um, which I threw up 190 spot this week, I am at a fab budget. And I am okay with that. You could place $0 bets, obviously. Um, but if anyone else bets alongside of you and puts any more money down, they beat you in that. But, uh, you know, I am of the thought that using your fab in the beginning of the season is perfectly fine because those are when the most valuable players are going to appear. Guys like Philip Lindsay, last year guys like Alvin Kamara, because in the beginning of the year, we don't know the depth charts that well. We don't know the roster movements. We don't know the snap counts and things like that. As the year progresses, we get more of a solidified look at what offenses really look like, right? We can, we can go by the preseason usage and stuff, but things change quickly in the beginning of the season. Obviously, injuries will happen to running backs and then their handcuff will be available, but I am more inclined on not banking on an injury like that, and I'd rather get players. Like, I spent a lot of fab on Philip Lindsay, on Quincy Nunez, um, on streaming quarterbacks and defenses and things like that, and I'm perfectly okay with that. So, I'm at a fab budget in one of my leagues, which is okay, um, because you can get a lot of guys for $0 bids, which is still cool. Um, we're going to run down my list of top waiver wire pickups for week five. As per usual, we will start off with the quarterbacks. I want to say, before we get into it, I will be traveling. I am flying out to Denver tomorrow night to meet with some of my marketing clients for the, we actually for a week, so Wednesday to next Tuesday. So in that time, I don't believe I'm going to be able to get out a video for Thursday and Saturday, which are my normal Q&A videos along with like my top DFS plays. I unfortunately won't be able to get those videos out, so I apologize to you guys for that. That being said, I will have the blog post version up for Saturday's top DFS plays. If you want to head over to my site, bigdogsfantasy.com, it will be linked down below as well. You can get to my site and then just scroll all the way to the bottom, sign up for the newsletter, and when those blog posts go on, uh, I will shoot you over an email so you know. So the video won't be up, but I will have the blog version up for you guys. But let's dive into the top waiver wire pickups. Again, as always, this will be um, players owned in less than 55% of leagues on Yahoo, so I go by that. And I always shoot prior to Monday Night Football. I know some of y'all motherfuckers don't be believing me. Like last week when I said Vance McDonald, you think I filmed it afterwards. But I'm going to get my phone so you can see this. 2.46 Monday. 2.46 p.m. Not a.m., you schmucks. It's, it's light out right now. Monday Night Football is going to be the Chiefs and the Broncos. There's no one that I think would be unowned in less than 55% of leagues that I want. Uh, the only guy that could end up on this list, I think, would be Cortland Sutton. If something were to happen to, like, Demarius Thomas or Emmanuel Sanders, he would obviously make the list. But other than that, there's no one on the waiver wire I think I want in either of these offenses. First quarterback on the list is my man, Baker Mayfield, 44% owned. Now, Baker had his first start as an NFL quarterback on Sunday. They were on the road uh, at Oakland. I know it's an easy pass defense, but... They are traveling kind of cross country there. He ended up throwing for 295 yards. Let me close the damn window. All right, so he ended up throwing for 295 yards, two touchdowns, um, which would normally end up being a good fantasy day if you had him in your lineup. However, however, his team did not help him out whatsoever. Uh, by that, I mean he threw two picks and he had two fumbles lost, which is obviously going to kill your fantasy value. Now, the two interceptions, the first one, uh, can be credited to Antonio Callaway. He was running a route, he fell, and then Baker passed it to him, and then he went to reach for it, and then it hit his hands, and then it was deflected for an interception. Uh, the second one was like Baker trying to drive down the last minute of the game, and he threw like a, a Hail Mary up kind of, and that got picked off. So both very fluky interceptions, in my opinion. The first one definitely was, a, was on the wide receiver. The second one was probably a bad decision by him. The two stripped sack fumbles actually we weren't both strip sacks but the first one was a strip sack in which like the right tackle got pushed back in the matter of like a second um and then his arm got hit so that wasn't really on him second one was a botch snap by the center and that unfortunately goes against baker mayfield and his fantasy points but i'm not i'm not worried about the turnovers those are easily avoid avoidable otherwise he looked very very good in my opinion um his teammates were credited with six drops on sunday 
So that is obviously not good, and that's going to hurt his bottom line. Um, and on the second drive, Baker left a few fantasy points on the field. He missed Antonio Callaway on like a 50-yard touchdown, which would have been a 50-yard touchdown, as well as overthrowing Jarvis Landry in the end zone on a slant. So he could have had a, it could have been three touchdowns and 350 yards. He could have had a much bigger day. So I'm happy with his performance overall. He looked like a, a good quarterback again. He looked very accurate, a lot of zip on the ball, just a few you know miscommunications and a couple bad plays that I don't expect to be part of his weekly routine going forward. So Baker Mayfield is definitely a guy that I want to grab. Now, he plays Baltimore and the Chargers over his next two games. Those are tough games. They are both at home, so there's a little bit of an advantage there. Uh, the Chargers have not been anywhere near as good as people thought they were going to be. But after Baltimore and after the Chargers, Tampa Bay, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Atlanta. Those are four teams in which you could probably literally stream any quarterback in the NFL against them and have good fantasy days. Tampa Bay, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Atlanta. So even if you don't want to play him against Baltimore and L.A., he is going to go on an absolute tear over those four games afterwards. So Baker is uh, someone that, again, I don't – if you just look at the bottom line and the stat line over this Sunday, you're going to be like, ah, it wasn't that good. But he played he played fine. So I would uh, I would probably spend between 7 and 10 bucks to get Baker if you need a quarterback. Second on this list is Derek Carr. He's been on this list week in and week out pretty much, and he threw for another 437 yards, four touchdowns against Cleveland and Baker. Um, he's now fourth in the NFL in passing yards with 1,373, averaging 343 yards per game, third highest adjusted completion percentage per PFF in the NFL right now. He gets L.A. next week on the road, which is tough. Um, but again, they have not been as great as people thought they were going to be. Uh, they just let C.J. Bethard throw for 298 yards, two touchdowns. A week before, Jared Goff, 354 yards, three touchdowns. So they're definitely not a matchup that you just need to avoid at all costs. Um, and after that, Derek Carr takes on the Earl Thomas list. Rip to the gut, Earl Thomas. Uh, an Earl Thomas list Seattle Seahawks defense gets a bye. Then he gets Indy and San Fran. So a nice schedule coming up for him if he is still unowned, which he is in 64% of leagues, you can grab him for five to seven bucks and feel good streaming him for the next few weeks. Blake Bortles, another guy that's been on this list week in and week out. He's someone, ah, man, like we thought we should have streamed him last week, and it turns out that we should have streamed him this week against the New York Jets. Went off for 388 yards, two touchdowns. Second time in three weeks that he has thrown for over 375 passing yards now. Now, Fournette retweaked his hamstring, and I'm pretty sure this is going to be a multi-week absence again for their, I don't want to say stud running back anymore because he just can't stay on the goddamn field, but for their starting running back, which means that they're probably going to rely more on Blake Bortles uh, passing the ball moving forward. And what better matchup could you have asked for than them playing the Chiefs in week five? So they'll travel to Arrowhead, where there will be plenty of points. There will be plenty of throwing. Um, and then they take on Dallas on the road in week six, which is tough. But then they get a home matchup versus Houston, which just let up about 4,000 fantasy points to Andrew Luck. So you could probably start Bortles in two of the next three games. And yeah, I mean, he, he's just a good week five streaming option against Kansas City. So he's another one you could start. And uh, fourth on this list is Marcus Mariota, owned in 33% of Yahoo leagues. He looked like a more competent quarterback in this one. I, honestly, this was the first time he looked like a competent fantasy quarterback in what seems like two years at this point. But after dealing with you know the elbow injury for the last two weeks, he finally comes in and he seems like he's passed it and he's healthy. Um, he came out firing in this one, which is a good sign. He threw for over like 110 or 115 passing yards in the first quarter. He ended up with 344 passing yards in the game, uh, two touchdowns on 43 attempts, adding 46 yards on the ground and another score. So those 43 passing attempts uh, is a good sign, is a good number that the Titans are going to let him throw the ball because you look back over his career, dating all the way back the last previous three years, he has only thrown more than 43 attempts in a game twice in his entire career. He threw for 43 uh, pass attempts on Sunday. So that is good going going forward. Also on the ground, last week he rushed for 51 yards. This week, 46 yards. So this is becoming a trend now. And we knew Mariota obviously is a, a very good running quarterback. So that always, you know, uh, heightens his floor as well as his ceiling. Last year, those numbers, 51 and 46, would have been the second and third highest game total of rushing yards that he had all season. So this this offense, once Mariota's healthy, hopefully can keep dialing it up and being productive. Um, now Mariota will travel to Buffalo. And uh, in week five, I think he's a good streaming option. The Bills have allowed the 11th most fantasy points to the quarterback position. I would grab uh, Mariota on the wire for somewhere, you know, four or five bucks. I'm not crazy excited about him, but I'm excited to see what's going to happen now with Taewon Taylor becoming more of a full-time player. So, Marks Mariota, another guy you can grab on the wire. Number five, there is one more after this, but we're going to go with Joey Flacco, Baltimore Ravens, 25% owned only still. Guys, I 
I, I, he's been on my list again every single week. And last week I said it, he's this year's Alex Smith. And he went out and proved it again. Um, all season, the talk was, you know, he's had his best camp so far. He's motivated. He's fired up. He's ready to sling the ball. And this is what we've seen. It's come to fruition. Him and Smokey Brown are a legit tandem. And uh, they're going to end up with some big numbers by the end of the year. On Sunday Night Football at Pittsburgh, he threw for 363 yards. It's his second time going over 360 passing yards this season. In 2017, he did not go for over 300 passing yards. Didn't even go for over 290 passing yards in a single game. He's already went over 360 twice this year. Um, through a quarter of the season, Flacco is on pace to throw for over 5,000 yards, and he's on pace for a 30 to 8 touchdown to interception ratio. He gets Cleveland and then Tennessee on the road, which aren't easy matchups, but both of them kind of just got treaded up or let up a lot of statistical production to Cleveland, Derek Carr, and Tennessee, Carson Wentz. So um, they get those two matchups on the road, then they get a Beautiful game versus the Saints pass defense in week, what is that, five, six, seven. So Flacco's a guy that I think you might be able to use for the rest of the season. So I would spend, you know, five to ten bucks if you need a quarterback. Last up on this list is Jameis Winston of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. 11% owned, widely available in Yahoo Leagues. I thought this was an easy, an easy, uh, an easy thing to see coming, right? Winston gets into the game at halftime. You know, see the tweets. Winston will be suiting up. Going into the third quarter for the Buccaneers, that got that got the juices flowing. He was someone I was so high on coming into the season, and then we heard about the suspension. Now he's finally back in the game. So he played the second half uh, of Sunday's game at Chicago. He finished the game completing 16 of 20 passes, so 80% completion percentage, 145 yards, a touchdown, two interceptions. Now, again, like Baker, I want to go back and not just read the box scores. So I watched the game on Game Pass. The first interception, Cleo Mack just bull rushed the right tackle, um, got to Winston's arm, and the ball just kind of flew up into the middle of the air. The safety picked it off. I don't put that on Winston. The second interception was really bad. He stared down the wide receiver, got picked off in plain sight. Those are things that are going to come with Winston, though. He's going to have those bad turnovers, but those first, you know, I don't expect him to throw two, three, multiple picks every single game. Um, what's encouraging, though, those 145 passing yards in one half against the tough Chicago defense is going to translate into fantasy points, right? In the 11 games in which he was the full-time starter last year, he was averaging over 310 passing yards per game. Um, so those numbers are going to be padded, and they're going to be big. Uh, so those 145 yards in a half against, it's not easy, right? He comes out to come off the bench completely cold on the road against a very tough Bears defense. It's not easy to put up those, you know, those types of numbers. And his 80% 80, 80 completion rate was impressive given the fact that his average depth of throw was 9.4 yards. It's not like Derek Carr, whose adjusted completion percentage was like 81%, but his A dot is like 6.5. Winston has always been a guy who's throwing at 9 to 10 yards down the field when he throws the ball. So the high completion percentage is very encouraging given the fact that he is someone who slings the ball down the field. So that's always good for, Sam, um, for you know uh, Winston and, and Tampa Bay Buccaneers in terms of statistics they're going to put up. And as Fitzpatrick had, Winston will have an insane group of weapons to work with between Deshaun Jackson, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. Um, O.J. Howard's hurt, but he loves Cameron Brait in the red zone. What might be most important is the fact that they are the opposite side of the Buccaneers, meaning that they get to play with the Buccaneers' defense. So the Buccaneers' defense is going to give up uh, about 5 million points to the opponent's team, which means Winston is going to be continuously throwing the ball a ton. Their defense is allowing 358 passing yards a game, a 13 to 1 touchdown to interception ratio, a league high 20 pass plays of 20 plus yards. We are four weeks into the season, people, um, and a league high 130.5 opposing quarterback rating. This defense is horrible, and it's going to benefit Winston and the offense. They have a, they have a bye in week five, um, so he'll be ready to roll. He'll have you know two weeks to get ready for their next matchup. And he's not going to be cold. He's not going to be off the bench. And he's not going to be against Chicago Bears. He's going to be against the Atlanta Falcons, who, like the Buccaneers, defense is horrible. But the Falcons are bad because, of course, they're depleted with injuries. They lost another couple guys on Sunday, I think. And uh, they are just they are getting worked, right? Whether it's Dalton, whether it's Breeze, it doesn't matter. Every quarterback is coming in and absolutely destroying the Atlanta Falcons. I expect no difference in their Week 6 matchup in the Dome. The over-under of this game has got to be like 250 points at this point. So uh, I'll probably still take the over there. So I really like Winston Week 6. I think he's going to put – I like him for the rest of the season as well. So him and Baker, I think, need to be owned everywhere and should be priority pickups. Not using the number one waiver wire, but I do like them a lot. 
And we'll move to the running backs. Um, and before we get into that, I want to obviously plug my Patreon page, patreon.com slash BDGE for the, for, oh, for the <clears throat> hang. For those of y'all that are Patreons and do subscribe to my page one, I appreciate the support. I love you for that too. All that stuff will still be coming out. The master stat sheet, my weekly rankings will be available to you guys Wednesday, Thursday morning, whenever it normally is. So don't worry about that stuff. Um, if you are interested in getting my weekly rankings, if you're interested in a private live stream, ooh, which I got to move to tomorrow night probably, um, have to uh, you know head over to patreon.com slash BDGE and you can subscribe there for all the exclusive ac access to myself, to your mans. Um, but we'll move on to the running backs. And first up on this list is the Jacksonville Jaguars backfield. Yeldon and Corey Grant. Yeldon is owned in 50% of leagues. Corey Grant just 2% of leagues. So, like I said, obviously Fournette leaves the game again with a hamstring injury. He re-aggravates it, and I think it's going to be a multi-week absence. I ain't going to say I told you so, but I might have tweeted this out a week ago. The fact that like a couple of days before this, he was listed as a game-time decision tells me that he's clearly not 100%. If you're 100%, you're not a game-time decision. If you're less than 100%, you should not be playing on an injured hamstring, ever. You need to be 100% clear before, days, days, days before the actual game kicks off. Otherwise, your re-injury risk is ridiculously high. So I tweeted that, I think, like four or five days before the game, whenever that Roto World blurb came out. Uh, but again, I expect this to be a multi-week absence, meaning Yeldon is going to be a plug-and-play RB2 for the remainder of Fournette's absence, just based on volume, right? People like to get cute with Corey Grant, and I get it. He's good, he's efficient, but he's never going to get the volume to uh, have you comfortable enough to play him in the lineup. Uh, Yeldon outsnapped Grant 48-7 to in this one, outtouched him 21-3. to Yeldon is a clear workhorse here. He turned those 21 touches into 100 yards from scrimmage and two touchdowns. They get, again, a fabulous matchup like Blake Bortles at Kansas City. So should be a lot of volume for the offense. Yeldon should be heavily involved in the passing game. He's a great play. He is my top waiver wire pickup of the week, and I would probably spend between $15 and $20 more if you are very needy for a running back. Number two, don't want to get too cute here, Ronald Jones of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I know y'all know this hurts me to say. He is 24% owned. And people are going to get unnecessarily excited about Ronald Jones. And I'm trying to be as objective as possible when I tell you that he still sucks, but he is going to get more work in this Bucks offense. This was the first time this year that he has actually been active, and they have not made him a healthy scratch. Um, their second round rookie running back, Ronald Jones. He outcarried Peyton Barber 10 to 7. He outtouched him 11 to 8. He ran for 29 yards on those 10 carries, 2.9 yards per carry, 2.0 yards after contact. Barber ran for uh, 3.4 yards per carry on his seven carries, 2.7 yards after contact. So from an efficiency standpoint, Barber, while still horrible, um, a little bit better than Ronald Jones, unsurprisingly. Both of them just caught one ball uh, on two targets. Each of them got two targets, so essentially nothing in the passing game as well. Barber actually outsnapped Jones in this one, 31 to 20. But it's clear that Barber has been bad, and they are going to give Jones every possible shot they can to see if he is going to outplay Barber. And, you know, you use a second-round pick, you want to use the guy, of course. Um, but, again, that does not mean, I understand this is the first time that he played and he outtouched Barber, that does not mean that he's going to become a 20-touch guy. It does not mean that after an awful preseason, all of a sudden Ronald Jones is going to be a top 24 running back in fantasy. Um what happened on Sunday may very be, very well be what happens for the remainder of the year in that they are running back by committee. We haven't seen the goal line. What happens if they get on the goal line and Barber, even if Jones is out carrying him 12 to 4, but Barber gets the goal line carries weighing 20 pounds more, Jones has essentially no fucking value in fantasy football still. So I'm not going to get crazy about Ronald Jones. They still have a very bad offensive line. I wanted to look at some numbers to clarify that. Um, outside of Ali Marpet. Ali, Ali Marpet, sorry for mispronouncing that, however you say it. Ali Marpet, which is one of their guards, you guys are probably like, what the fuck is an Ali Marpet? One of their guards, he is the only, the single offensive lineman on the Buccaneers uh, that has graded inside the position's top 30 in run blocking per pro football focus. Every other lineman is outside of the position's top 30 in terms of run blocking. They are dead last in football outsiders run blocking DVOA. So it's still a horrible line, it is a bad situation. Um, and it's a backfield I'm just completely avoiding until further notice. But if you're in a deeper league and you think you have upside here, go for it. My personal opinion is one, well, they're on a bye next week, and then they're at Atlanta and then Cleveland. Um, 
I'm not spending more than two to three dollars on Ronald Jones, and that's only if I really need running backs. So I, I'm avoiding the the backfield situation altogether. You can yes, you could definitely drop Peyton Barber at this point. Third and final running back on this list is out of Indianapolis, Naeem Hines, the rookie pass catching back. That's basically all he is at this point. Owned in 15% of leagues, needs to be owned in 100% of PPR leagues. Now Hines is becoming a back you can play by default because of you know his role in this offense. Now, T.Y. Hilton got hurt on Sunday and has basically already been announced for, uh, he's been announced that he's gonna miss this week's game because they play on a short leash or a short break, right? They play Thursday Night Football at New England in Foxborough. So I have a few days to rest. Hilton's basically already been ruled out for this one. Jack Doyle uh, has been out of the last two games. He has not even gotten a limited practice in, so it seems like he is pretty far from, um, Seems like he's pretty far from getting back into the lineups. So you have Hilton out, you have Jack Doyle out, who are usually Andrew Luck's top two targets. Marlon Mack has also been out, and I have no idea whether he is going to return anytime soon. If he is out, you are looking at three of the top weapons in this offense being out. Now, Hines saw a team high 11 targets on Sunday, 11, um, which far and away led the, the running backs in targets. Uh, he led the running backs in snaps over Wilkins, 62 snaps to 31 over Jordan Wilkins. Uh, he converted those 12, 11 targets into a team high nine catches for 63 yards and two touchdowns. He gives you almost nothing in the run game. He only gets a handful of carries and doesn't do much with them because he's such a small player in stature. But he has now caught five or more passes in three or four games so far this season, and he should be heavily involved if Hilton Doyle and Mack are all ruled out in which could be a shootout of a game, right? They're going to Foxborough. Again, like I said, they should be trailing. It is a 53-point over-under, which is the second highest over-under of Week 5. Um, so I would expect Hines to catch at least five passes, if not more, like kind of like we saw in uh, in Week 4 when he caught nine passes. So they get at New England, they're at New York, uh, the Jets, and then they're home against Buffalo. He needs to be owned in PPR leagues. I would probably, if you need a running back to plug in and play, uh, I'd go anywhere from like five to ten bucks in that range. I would not use my number one waiver wire on him, though. And that will conclude the running backs. And we move over to wide receiver. And guys, like, like I was saying, man, the running backs are bare. There's not a lot of good pickups. There's not a lot of great pickups at wide receiver that are that are unowned highly in a lot of leagues. And that's why I say I'm okay using a lot of my fab budget early on. I know a lot of people like to keep that, right, for wait for that big injury, but like it's not, doesn't always happen. And you might get outbid on that injury anyways, and then you're screwed. You don't, you know, you don't go for your guys. You got to be selectively aggressive. Maybe using all of your fab budget in the first month of the season isn't smart, but you should be aggressive in the beginning of the season because that's when players turn out and end up being good pickups for the entirety of the season. First up on this list is Antonio Callaway, Cleveland Browns, owned in 38% of leagues. He was a guy I was high on last week uh, getting picked up, and guys, he was like a few inches away from a monster game. And that seems to be the mantra of the games that he's had so far. Uh, the box score does not tell the story. He had like 50 receiving yards, something like that. He was only like seven yards shy of leading the team in receiving yards, actually. But he had another nine targets. The involvement is great from what you're seeing. Um, and that gives him 20 total targets over the last two weeks with an average depth of target of 17 and a half yards in that span, which is huge. He's seen 25% of the team targets since Baker Mayfield has taken over, 43% of the air yards on this team, and he's playing on 80% of the team snaps. Like I said, the big games are just inches away. Um, they play Baltimore and they play the Chargers at home, which are tough matchups. After that, just like Baker, he gets a ridiculous stretch of games where he plays Tampa Bay, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Atlanta. I really think Callaway is going to be a top 24 fantasy wide receiver option over that span. If you need a wide receiver, I would spend anywhere from 10 to $15 to get him because, like I said, for the third time already in five seconds, he's inches away from going over 100 yards again and a touchdown. Every single game so far, he's been like this far away from having a deep bomb fall into his hands for a touchdown, and it's only a matter of time before those start sticking. As the chemistry starts building up, they get more reps together, things are going to be good. And obviously, he's had some concentration drops, and those that's been a problem for him, but um, the volume is there, and there's no one that's overtaking him in that offense. So get Callaway. If you can't get Callaway, get Taewon Taylor. Tennessee Titans owned in 13% of leagues. We have Rashard Matthews gone. Taylor is now moving into... Finally, the role of wide receiver two. He flashed in preseason, right? He flashed all, all preseason. There was a lot of buzz and a lot of hype behind him. He's making plays, scoring touchdowns, doing all this. We expect him to have a big role. Um, all he does is make plays when he's on the field. However, however, you know, the, the problem was never his skill or, you know, his, his measurable or his metrics or anything like that. The problem was the Titans, for some reason, just didn't want to use him. They finally did on Sunday. Caught seven of nine targets for 77 yards. He was obviously the afterthought given Corey Davis's explosion, but those numbers, nine targets, 77 yards, seven catches, are very, very good in most formats. 
Um, so it is the second week out of the last three weeks in which he has hit double digit fantasy points, low key. The problem was, like I said, him not getting enough snaps. But I'm looking at the snap counts, and every week since week one, Taylor has gone up in snap share, snap percentage, right? The time that he's played, uh, the percentage of teams' plays have gone up every single week so far. And Tajay Sharp, who is running as a wide receiver too, his snap count has gone down as he's done nothing. So you're looking at Taewon Taylor, who is in an offense that desperately needs playmakers, right? Derrick Henry sucks. They're getting nothing from their running game. Delaney Walker is out. Rashard Matthews is now gone. Tajay Sharp is not really playing. So you're looking at an offense that might be siphoning 50% of their targets through just Corey Davis and Taewon Taylor. And you want pieces in offenses that only siphon to certain players like we're seeing in Detroit and like we're seeing in LA and like we're seeing in uh, Denver, right? These are teams that don't have a tight end, so they just need to feed all their targets to the wide receiver ones and twos. And that's what Taewon Taylor is. So I would use between five, eight, maybe 10 bucks if you want. He's someone who I think has a lot of upside given the fact that they don't really have any playmakers in that offense right now. Third on this list is a combination of Ryan Grant and Chester Rogers for the same reasons that Naeem Hines was on this field. Um, you know, Doyle being out, Hilton being out, Marlon Mack being out. They are basically next in line for Andrew Luck, who is starting to get better and better as the season is progressing. I predicted him to have a big game in week four. Thus, everything I say comes to fruition. Now, every, every once in a while, you know, I, I do something right and I say good things that come out of my mouth. And this was one of them. Um, now with Hilton out, Chester Rogers and Ryan Grant are the de facto wide receiver ones and twos. Neither guy has much touchdown upside, but they are playing about 80% of the snaps and they are high floor PPR plays. Grant is currently on pace for 72 catches and 752 receiving yards on the year, um, while Chester Rogers is coming off a, a game where he caught 8 of 11 targets for 85 yards so, um, as you can see, they're going to they're gonna be guys who catch probably five to seven passes while all these players are out and can give you, you know, if you're really desperate and you're in a deeper league, you need a flex player or wide receiver three, they'll give you somewhere from like seven to 12 fantasy points. So, um, I would grab either of them for just a couple bucks off the wire. Last name on this list is a guy you really need to be paying attention to, Kiki Kuti. I believe I'm saying that right. Let me know if I'm saying it wrong down in the comment section. While you're down there, hit me with that thumbs up. If you think I've been giving you value thus far, I would very much appreciate a thumbs up. If you are new to the podcast or the YouTube channel, you can subscribe, leave a rating and review. It's highly appreciated. Uh, it lets me know that you guys like these videos and I'll keep making them, of course. Kiki Kuti, Houston Texans, fourth round rookie slot receiver, owned in 2% of leagues. That number needs to be exponentially up. Here's a stat that I saw on Twitter today. Texans wide receiver Kiki Kuti had the most receptions, 11, by a wide receiver making his NFL debut since 1970. He had 15 targets on Sunday, which tied Corey Davis, Tyler Boyd, and Stephon Diggs for the NFL lead in week four. He turned those 11 catches into 109 yards. Now, Bruce Ellington was the slot receiver here in Houston. Uh, he was sent to the IR with an injury. Now, Will Fuller is banged up and left the game with a hamstring injury. He's been on and off all season, all summer. He missed the first couple weeks with a hamstring injury, and now he's banged up again, which could mean much increased playing time, snap share, whatever, for um, Kuti. Kuti played on 93% of their snaps already, and he saw 36% of the team's targets. Now, it might seem like a, a crowded wide receiver group in Houston, but it's really not. They do not have a tight end that they throw the ball to. Lamar Miller and Al Alfred Blue have, have done next to nothing in the uh, in the receiving game. Uh, Hopkins and Fuller are one of those teams, just like the Broncos, where their top two receivers account for 52% of the team's targets right now. If Fuller is out, Cootie could easily be the number three playmaker in here and move up to the number two playmaker behind Hopkins, uh, depending on his uh, severity of the injury, right? And uh, we don't... I think Bill O'Brien said it was like precautionary at first. Then he came out and said it's not precautionary and they're going to have to monitor the situation, whatever. We're going to have to monitor as the as the week goes on. Now, Kuti, if you're unfamiliar with, played at Texas Tech. He was a fourth-round pick for the Texans. Uh, he runs a 4-4-3, 40-yard dash, which is very fast. He missed most of the summer as well as the first few games with a hamstring injury. He's working his way back. Now he is back and he's fully healthy, as you can see by his performance on Sunday. If Fuller misses time, I think Kuti plugs in as a no-brainer flex if not wide receiver three play. Now, Watson has not been efficient, uh, but he's putting up, you know, video game numbers again, just because the amount of volume that he throws the ball and just like this defense has been horrible. 
Um, so Kudi is a stash in every single league. If Fuller is out, um, he should probably be in your lineup, especially in PPR league. So they get Dallas at home, Buffalo at home, then they're at Jacksonville. Uh, Dallas is a matchup in which you can ex exploit the slot. That was the reason I had Golden Tate on my top DFS plays video last week. While their outside uh, cornerbacks are pretty good and they did a good job of stabilizing Kenny Galladay and... Uh, and Marvin Jones there, the slot is open. The middle of the field is open, especially without Sean Lee. Kuti could run a lot of those routes over the middle, and it could be a big game for him. So I would, uh, if you need a wide receiver, if you need production ASAP, I I'd throw some heavy money at, at Kuti. And we'll move on to the tight end position. Before we do that, I want to just quickly thank our sponsors for the video. That is FantasyJocks.com. As always, y'all know they hook the mans up. They got rings, they got belts, they got trophies, Lombardi looking ass trophies over on their website. It's everything you need for your fantasy football league or fantasy baseball league, fantasy basketball league. They don't discriminate. Whatever you need, fantasyjocks.com has you. 10% off using promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP. So your boys hooking you up. The link will be down below in the, de in the description. High ass quality gear, I promise you that. This stuff is awesome. I use it for my money leagues. We've been using it for years now. You can get the championship team names engraved on there. So you got a list, you got his history. Shit is historic out here at fantasyjocks.com. So make sure you check them out and thank you for sponsoring today's video. Let's move over to the tight end position. First up on this list is Vance McDonald of the Steelers clearly becoming the pass catching tight end in this offense um, i told you all about him last week i said to look out on monday night football he goes off he has another strong game this week in which he catches i think five or six passes for like 60 or 70 yards i didn't even fill out my tight end section to be honest you're just gonna be speaking out the mouth speaking out the uh, straight out the dome right now um, but you saw his snap count rising week over week from week two to week three to week four and now he is basically the only tight end getting targeted in this offense um Le'Veon bell is still out so there is room for him to kind of dominate. McDonald is a very athletic pass-catching tight end. Next week, they play Atlanta at home. So he is still available in 57% of leagues. For those of y'all that are hurting, because I know a lot of you guys are, now that O.J. Howard is hurt and now that someone else got hurt, right? I, f I forget who else got hurt. Oh, Tyler Eifert, of course, cracked his ankle. Oh, man, that was fucking brutal. They had that on red zone for like 35 seconds too long yesterday, man. I was sitting, like, watching it, and I was screaming at my TV. I was like, turn this fucking shit off, Chris Hansen. You psych Chris Hansen probably psycho ass probably enjoyed that shit, to be honest with you. But that's neither here nor here. Vance McDonald is a guy that needs to be owned in every league as a, as a tight end position gets thinner and thinner and thinner. They get Atlanta, like I said, at home. So that should be another shootout. I think the over-under in that is like 56 and a half. McDonald should be heavily used again. Big Ben is starting to gain the chemistry with him. Number one tight end waiver wire pickup. Number tight, uh, number two is Cameron Bray of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for a couple reasons. First of all, the biggest one of which is, of course, O.J. Howard hurts his knee. I think it is a sprained MCL. I saw on Twitter that it is the same thing that Evan Ingram is dealing with. Um, and he should be sidelined from like two to four weeks. Um, so I think he will be sidelined at least two weeks. If he comes back in the third week, he will probably be limited in that sense. And um, they do get a, a buy in week five. So I was going to say, depending on the severity, you might not even want to pick him up. But since it is a longer injury, you're definitely going to want to pick up Cameron Bray if you are desperate at tight end. James Winston coming back is great because he loves Cameron Bray in the red zone. Bray has scored a ton of touchdowns with Winston. The connection down there is very, very real. We saw it again on Sunday. Um, James' only touchdown went to Cameron Bray, and I expect a lot of targets, especially red zone targets going forward with the Winston and Bray connection, as long as O.J. Howard is on the sidelines. So if you are desperate, Cameron Bray is a great pickup. Obviously, you can't play him this week, but you get Atlanta in the week after that, which should, again, be uh, a matchup to exploit. Third and final guy on this list is Ricky Seals-Jones of the Arizona Cardinals, 22% owned. And really the only reason I want him on here is uh, is because Josh Rosen is under center. And now Josh Rosen obviously gave this team a lot more hope than Sam Bradford. He looked good. I mean, he looked bad at some points, um, but he made some good throws. And he was, you know, um, making big plays, which is something that the Cardinals offense has desperately missed over the first three weeks of the season while Sam Bradford was there. Ricky Seals-Jones caught, I think, like a 30-yard touchdown. So it's good to see that Rosen is targeting him down there, and that's where they should be using him. So I'm not ready to just plug and play Ricky Seals-Jones whatsoever, but... Um, he's someone that you could stash and hope that as Rosen gets more comfortable, him and Seals Jones gain this chemistry here. He plays at San Francisco, at Minnesota, Denver. Uh, San Francisco just let up a touchdown to Antonio Gates, so there's some upside here. Minnesota's a tough matchup. Denver is a matchup you can exploit at the tight end position. Again, I'm only spending a couple dollars here, and uh, I'm not using a valuable waiver wire on him, but he's someone to keep an eye on. Tyler Eifert, like I just mentioned, cracked his ankle. He's out for the year. If you're taking a tight end here, guys, it's not Tyler Croft. It is C.J. 
Ozuma. I'm probably saying that wrong as well. But if you want one, it's CJ Ozuma. He is the one who's been running behind Eifert. He leads Tyler Croft. He leads the tight end group in snaps, in routes run, in receptions, in targets, in receiving yards, all that shit. So don't waste the waiver wire on Tyler Croft because you like remember him from last year. It is CJ Ozuma if you are in a deep league and you lost Eifert. That's the guy you want. Um, defensive special teams players. Uh, let me pull up the gambling website that I always use. And guys, I will read it. <clears throat> reiterate this every time if you're looking for a streaming option on defense three criteria they have to be favored in the game they have to be at home and they have to be in a low over under total i told you last this week my favorite one by far and away was the green bay packers i picked them up in as many leagues as i can they delivered with like a 20 point fantasy point performance my detail my defensive streams have been fucking fire this whole entire year so i'm looking at some guys that are uh, under-owned in 50% of leagues. Carolina Panthers is the first one that comes to mind. They were my stream of the week two weeks ago. I think they had 10 or 11 fantasy points. They play as six and a half point favorites at home against the Giants next week, 44 and a half point over under. So low scoring game in which the Carolina Panthers are at home and favored to win by almost a touchdown. They should be your number one option if they're available on the waiver wire. Who else do we got here? Cincinnati Bengals, six-point favorites against the Miami Dolphins at home. Uh, 50 and a half point over-under is not a great thing. I don't think they're going to hit 50 and a half points, though, to be honest with you. Um, so Cincinnati would probably be my second favorite team here. They are definitely widely available, I'm sure, in leagues. The other one here is interesting. The 49ers are four and a half point favorites at home with an over-under of 41. That's a really low over-under. Normally, I do not... My fourth criteria, if I need to break a tie, it is that I don't want to play defenses that are not good defenses. You know what I mean? And I'm not sure I would qualify the 49ers defense as a good real-life defense, but they uh, that means that if it's a four-and-a-half point spread, 41 point over-under, they have the what the Cardinals projected to score a team total of like 17-and-a-half points, which is pretty low. So they like the 49ers. If you are that desperate, it would go Carolina, Cincy, San Francisco as my three defensive streaming options of the week. That is all I got for you today. Uh, I hope that helped you guys out. If it did, of course, hit that thumbs up button. Hit the subscribe button if you are new, if you're listening via podcast, rating, and review. Again, I will be in Denver, and I will be videotaping the whole trip, so wait on my vlog, my vlogs. I know some young people get mad at me when I call them vlogs for some reason, but you know I'm an old soul here. I talk I talk how I want to over here, um, but if you haven't checked out my vlogs, I, uh, I suggest you do so. I think I got some good life insights. You think I go in-depth on fantasy football, man? You'll probably think I'm fucking insane in my vlogs, but... Uh, that's all I got for today. Hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see y'all maybe next week, I guess. Or maybe I'll try to live stream on Sunday, but that's all I got for you. So, peace.